At the Paris C Palace, high above 3733's Broadway, this is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you on Power Talk here on a beautiful Saturday morning here in the desert. We are cooking away. It's already about 110 degrees and it's only 10 in the morning. And uh, have an opportunity to reconnect with a dear friend, a guy who uh, I definitely haven't totally figured out why, but uh, definitely spiritually connected to this cat. And uh, what an honor. M. Tume, <laughs> welcome back to the Jake Feinberg hey, Show, brother. Hey, man. What's up, baby? How you feel, man? I'm feeling great, man. I mean, it, it, it's, always a, it's always serendipitous. I... Um, I, you know, I, I got I got to tell you something. Um, I, uh, I when I talked to your your uncle Tootie, he said right. the first interview. Um, he it, like it was literally the when I set up the day after the the election. So Trump had just gotten elected, and he said uh, he said that when, the first thing I said. You know, I mean, like he said, you know, M. Tume, uh He said he predicted uh, way back that Trump, right. Trump was going to win. And then, at, <laughs> then going back a year, by the way, because we know we had the recently completed NBA right. finals and uh, Steph Curry won this time. But but last year, you said, no, LeBron's taking it home. And he sure did. So right. T- Tootie was saying, listen, I'm not – and next time you make a, make a prediction, I'm not going to deny that. But um, <laughs> what – what, I mean, I, I felt it coming too. I, I, I mean, uh, but, but tell me why you made that proclamation. Hmm. Okay, man, that's a great question. First of all, I started when I predicted that he'd win the primary. When I saw, like, what was it, about 16 guys up there on the Seven, stage? 17, yeah. And I saw him, yeah, I saw him slap every one of them. And these are all professional politicians. Uh, you know, uh, the governor, uh, the Bush, and, uh, uh, and, and Ron, Rand Paul, and just one after another. And uh, I said, wait a minute, there's something happening here. Uh, because he kept exposing them. He said, these guys grovel for money. He said, I've given to most of their campaign. And at that moment, I saw and that was the first, the first debate. And I saw everybody, you know, oh, no, he, I, I didn't take any money from you. And it was like, wait a minute, this is pitiful, man. And then I realized that the news cycle, 24-7, on CNN, MSNBC, Fox, obviously, but the other two so-called quote-unquote progressive stations, every newsreel and every show started with Trump, Trump, Trump. And I said, do these fools understand that if you say somebody's name 24-7, you're keeping them in the news, even if it's dumb stuff. I mean, like, he would do a debate and say, Mexicans are this, and uh, we, we can't let Muslims come in, and every liberals will go crazy. And I said, yeah, but then you cover it for the next three or four days. And he was controlling the news cycle. I said, oh, my God, he's turning politics into a reality show. And when he won the primary, and here's a very important thing. I I, I, I don't want to belabor this, but I was looking at the Democratic Party from a different lens. I thought Hillary Clinton was a flawed candidate, and I know that will make a lot of people upset. You know, I'm not a Republican. Of course, I'm, you know, I have left lean, uh, leanings, if anything. But I thought she was a flawed candidate. The reason why, when Bernie Sanders... A 74-year-old white man from Vermont who's a socialist comes out and snatches the youth vote, then something's wrong with your main candidate's message. You're, da- you're, you're darn you right know? about and that. You know, and by the way, he's from Brooklyn. He, he, but yeah, He's from Brooklyn, but he's, yeah. He's, but I mean, no, no, yeah. but I mean, he's with, with, uh, Vermont. I think that's the state that he's Exactly. Yeah, at, right? no, I dig. I dig. Right, right. Yeah, right. Now, I know he's a Brooklyn guy. Yeah. But the point being, how does this happen? Hmm. And then I realized, Man, I was sitting up one day, and it hit me. I said, there's a revolution happening in both parties right. at the same time, on Trump's side and on the Bernie side. There was a revolution happening within the party itself. The difference between Trump and Bernie, and this is very important, Trump realized at a certain point he was no longer a candidate. He was a movement. Bernie never realized that. He kept thinking he was a candidate, and he thought he could play ball with the Clintons. And the Clintons were splitting his throat. You saw the emails that came out with the, between Hillary, the Hillary's camp and, and the, uh, the DNC. She's working hand-in-hand hand with, with uh, Wasserman Schultz, who got fired just before the, the, the convention started. Well, no, I, you know, so the, the, I you're, 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 listen, we're, I, want you, I want you to stay there. I, I, do, I, I want to go back to this thing, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Primaries, okay. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was home. My folks yeah. are beautiful people and very liberal and progressive in their own way. Um, 
uh, Bernie wins. Uh, now, whatever you want to say about the clown show, uh, the you know they had 17 candidates. Trump became in in and of himself a movement. Okay, but they they did it. Yeah. Where seven, they got down 17 candidates, and it was kind of painful. But they eventually got to the one. Bernie won 36 out of 40 precincts in New Hampshire during the Democratic primary and got zero right. ele- electoral votes. So th- to me. Now again, Russia's got to. We got to find out. We got to play out how this whole thing worked out with Russia. But the man, don't go. Listen, listen to me. Don't go down that rabbit hole, man. It's bullshit. It's bull. So no, my, my point is I that mean, I, it, I see the Democrats wrong. as almost maybe more flawed than the Republicans at this point. You know, that's that's what I'm was trying to get at there. Right. Okay. Let me ask you this. That's yeah. a great point. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. What's the difference? See, the real problem is this. You only have a two party system, which is stupid for a country of 300 million people. You only got chocolate or vanilla. If you go into any ice cream store in America, how many flavors do 31 have? flavors, I'm man. 31. <laughs> so why do you get down to politics and you can only have one or the other? You want to buy some shoes? You got how many colors do you have? You want to buy pants or a shirt, right. a necktie? You have options. There's no options in American politics. And until a third option is created, I don't care if it's a third party or just go independent, this country for, will forever be caught up in the hemorrhoid of a two-party system. Uh. Because when one is in power, the other, the other party just waits four or eight years, and then they just, they just switch hands. It's ping-pong. There's no real change. And look what the Democrats are doing. I want to address, I went around that circle to address your point. It's fine. They're becoming obstructionists, just like the Republicans were doing Obama. They ain't going to let nothing pass. What are they doing? They, you can't win, and, and the point I want to make, you can't win an election preaching what you're against. You got to convince people of what you're for, and the Democrats were just anti-Trump. And that doesn't win you an election. I don't want to know what you're against. What are you for? And the other problem that they had was this election, more than any election we've ever seen, experience was a deficit. Nobody cared about your experience because the, the country's in a terrible position. So what has this experience got us? Nineteen trillion dollar deficit, wars that we haven't been able to get in or out of, to perpetual war, and it's like. And it's Republicans and Democrats. And so people didn't care. And that's what the, that was the door that opened for Trump. I the other thing that you saw yeah. in this... Go ahead. No, well, no, no, interrupt me when you want, because, you know, I... I'm sorry. I have to be no, we're just, we're just, this is be, we're, this is bebop right here. We're having a ball. No, I want I th- this is so important because when I I listened back this morning because I got a, a, an excerpt I want to play for you later from my first interview with Tootie, mm-hmm. but 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 we I said you know uh, I. I, this is the day after the election. I said I voted for Hillary Clinton, but I didn't vote uh, because I thought she was a great candidate. I think she might have turned out to be a decent president, but she was not a good candidate. I said I voted for Hillary yeah. because I wasn't anti-Trump. I was pro Barack Obama. Okay, because the point is that. Okay, so the point is now. I think what is dystopic and really nefarious about the situation is that um, it appears to me all the, you can you can give shock you can give these uh, you know the shocks to all these institutions and 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 try to break them down and and whatnot. But what systematically is happening amidst all this circus stuff is that Trump is trying to erase all of Obama's legacy, and that is the yeah. that, that and that to me is an insulting thing to all people who supported this, 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 this great cat. You can call him too scholarly. He may not have been a volatile rageaholic that tapped into the rage that's out there in different parts of this country, but he did his mm-hmm. thing. And no, con- I mean, when W came, I mean, whatever, W came in after Clinton, it's not like you're going out of your way to repeal the major, major pieces of legislation. I think that that is the point that I'm looking at here saying, dude, the vetting thing that he took to the Supreme Court Obama already had serious. There's no difference in the vetting process. Sure, it just has sure, to be. It has to sure. be very clear that we're not letting these these immigrants in. We're no longer that shining city on the hill. So that, to me, was is the. Well, actually, def- that shining city was a tale of two cities. <laughs> you don't. No, no. You're. Don't, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. That was really. I'm just. What I'm getting at is this nefarious thing to say. Get this guy. I mean, they can't even. The funniest thing is that it's going to wind up being called Obamacare. They they, they, they can't get rid of it, but yeah, they yeah. they are they well, want to get what? rid of it. The interesting part is it was always that 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 uh, health care system was instituted by Mitt Romney 
and it came out of the Republican paper. Exactly, Republican exactly, paper. exactly. But Mitt Romney was too stupid to embrace it as his own, so they said Obamacare. So it, but it was de- it's based off a Republican platform. That's the crazy part about all this. But here, but here we go. Look, man, at the end of the day, elections have consequences. And what the Democrats keep refusing to understand, you don't go to a gunfight carrying a box of toothpicks. <laughs> right. This is not like it was. It's not civility. It's a win or you lose. You either run or you win. And the Democrats don't have not come to grips with that. The, the Republicans say boo, and they, they flinch every time. And it's MMA politics. This is not boxing anymore. You kick, you bite. I mean, this is what it is, man. I mean, don't fight reality. You deal with it. And they're trying to act like they're high, high level. But it's just cats on both sides trying to get reelected. Politics is not about ideology anymore. It's about personally being reelected. So you just vote, you know, and, and look, you're right about Trump. But don't forget, he's the guy that started the birther movement. Exactly. What are you talking about? Right. Of course he wants to do that. But why did the Democrats lose? See, I don't want to know why Trump won. That's not the question for Democrats to ask. The question they want to ask, and they won't look at it, why did you lose if you had the most qualified uh, person running? The first woman who didn't even win the female vote? Come on, what are we talking about? That's like Obama being the first black candidate didn't get the black vote. Then he's a dismiss. How come she couldn't even win the woman's vote? There's something there deeper than Trump. There was a change in the temperature of the country, and the Democrats to this day have not read the thermometer correctly. And if they don't look out, they're going to lose in 2020. I don't even know if it's Trump or not, but he's already running for re-election. You saw that. Uh, and, and I mean, absolutely. I, you, no, oh, yeah, no, the, okay. Yeah, so we'll, I want to hit the rabbit hole because, uh, I, you know, he is um, so vulgar and beyond like, you know, and I totally am with you. He's playing by this totally reality TV set of rules and these other cats are playing by more civility or whatever they're playing by the political, the po- politically correct kind of thing. And they're, and they're really, they, they, you know, they took toothpicks to a gunfight, but what, how, what are you going to, what, what would change your tune if in fact, um, there were, I mean, listen, if, the, 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 listen, Comey, when he came out, really screwed everything up. But also that 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 residual drip of all those ridiculous emails uh, cost Hillary Clinton and made her look really bad. And if, in fact, Mike Flynn was the one who was who was, you know, funneling those to Wikipedia, how would that change your view, if at all? Well, first of all, we don't know that for sure. And I'm not saying you're not correct. Right. You get what I'm saying? We don't know. But let's let's start. Let's start with this whole. When I said the rabbit hole, let's start with this. <laughs> Census election, what is this, man? June? I mean, not like going, I mean, July? The election was in November. Every wave of the Democratic protest, let's start with, oh, he's got to show his taxes. He doesn't legally have to do that. We, don't you think this guy's got a, 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 a stable of 200 lawyers? He's way ahead of the game. And we squeak, and remember everybody's going, he's got to show his taxes. No, that is not a law that the presidential candidate has to release his taxes. That was a courtesy. And he said, I'm not giving you that courtesy. The next, the next rabbit hole, and that went on for months. Oh, oh, he's got to divest all his interests and in his company. He's got to put it all in the blind truck. Do you remember that argument? Oh, uh, sure. Every day. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, no, he doesn't. They don't look up the law. So they got everybody going down that rabbit hole. And then what did he do? He had a, he had a fundraiser, what, the other day at his own hotel, right? Sure. The rabbit holes, Russia, the rabbit, if they don't come up with something that connects to him, they keep diverting our attention, man, away from more serious stuff. Well, no, but I mean, but I mean, okay, fair enough. If whatever they do with health care, it doesn't seem like they can get their act together, but they want to move on to tax reform. And the point about taxes is if you want to eliminate the AMT, alternative minimum tax, that would save him, you know, he would would have had to pay $25 million less in taxes. So it is relevant. It comes back again. And I, I also look at it and I say, hey, man, you know, let this thing play out. But the Democrat, no, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. But the Democratic Party is following rabbit holes, man. They're not talking about what you're talking about. We're talking about Russia. That's, I mean, I'm so sick of CNN, MSNBC. I, put, I turned to them to get some alternative information. And they're all on the same, every show, man. You know this. Starts off with Russia. Russia. But hey, look, they haven't gotten anything to stick to him. And my point is, if you do all this and you don't stick impeachment on him, you can't make a real connection legally. 
the blowback is going to be monstrous because all he's doing now is reinforcing his base. And we don't understand that. You know, the Trump and the Democrats, I mean, the Trump and the Republicans are so dumb. So why they keep winning? See, that's what I'm trying to <laughs> Well, I'm no, but I mean, that speaks them. to the peeps, man. I, the, other, the other thing I would say is that... Um, I'm with you on the rabbit holes, man. But it just—it's like you almost get this sense where it's like, oh yeah, there's nothing there. It's you know, it's it, they've become unhinged and just move away from it. I the one thing that I will say. No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm saying, stop. The left needs to stop just going down a rabbit hole and buying into it, because none of it has come up to, to prove anything. But that's all I'm saying. Then there's more other things happening in the world and in their lives than this. But they've been running through the rabbit hole that he sets up. He'll make a dumb statement, and then look, what have we been talking about for the last three days? Yeah, no, the the yeah the 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 Joe Scarborough. Yeah, the the facelift. Yeah, the facelift. Come on, man. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm with you, man. Listen, man. It's delu- so, Listen, but who's carrying that story? MSNBC, CNN, the quote unquote liberal. It's stupid, and they keep getting stuck on stupid. And I'm saying, if he's so dumb, do you understand he's manipulating the news? So his name is said over and over, and we stuck on stupid, and we think he's dumb. Well, who's dumb? That's where I'm at. I'm tired of being dumb, man. Let me rethink this. There's something happening that I'm not really clear about. And Democrats and quote-unquote progressives don't understand it. You had four uh, 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 post-elections that just happened, what, last month, a few weeks ago. They, and they said it's going to be a referendum on Trump, especially Virginia. They lost. The Democrats lost all four. There's something deeper than just labeling somebody or, 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 or a party, and then by the label you dismiss them. Or they're clowns. Okay, you dismiss it. Well, why does the clown keep winning? That's what I need to understand. And I'm tired of just going along with the party line. No, I'm the uh, the, absolutely. I, yeah, ab- no, I mean, I, I think that this is all legit. I just say... Um, when you're when you're going down to, when you're going down to rural when when you send the, the when the Economist the magazine sends rural sends these you know these uh, these cats down to interview women in in, in rural America who are you know very deeply uh, Christian people and wouldn't right. get, you know wouldn't give Obama a vote if his life depended on it despite the fact that he right. was one of those upstanding and they're saying well you know. Yeah, he really is so inappropriate, but you know we're willing to look past it. You know, it's like this is right. this right. this is um, this is this goes back to the original sin of our country, and 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 nobody's going to t- talk me off of that. And and uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was a poor, poor, poor candidate, but at the end of the day, I don't think Trump, I I Trump, I think the, that his voters and his base. And by the way, I want to make this point too. Uh, when Hillary made that comment about the basket of deplorables, what I've real oh, no, deplorables. Come Deplor- on, what, what, what I what I realized is that actually, what's humbling for me, M. Tume, is that that's actually a very small percentage of his base. A larger percentage are just jerks. They're just really bad. They're they're mean. Some in some cases very okay. wealthy people. Okay. See, here's my here's what I said earlier. And I wanted to reemphasize that. Yeah. See, sometimes when you label something, it relieves you of the responsibility of trying to examine it. Okay, so and so, this guy is a child, or he's a he's a fag, or he's a this, or he's a that. You know what I mean? You use words to label something, or uh, he's a racist, and then I label it, but it relieves me of trying to look into it. And I think too much has been put on, or oh, everybody like everybody who voted for Trump was racist. Your parents weren't racist, okay? Something that was racism in there. Did he peel back the civility? of America and show what we really are? Yes, but it wasn't all racism. It was people who have been disenfranchised. It's people that the Democratic Party, because there is an elitist element, and it goes from New York through California and Frisco, okay? The rest of America, they're based, they don't have soldiers on the ground. And let's also understand that during the eight years that Obama, I know we spoke, I know this is music, but we're getting into deep politics. It's all right. The eight years of Obama occupied, the Democrats occupied the White House. They now lost governorships. I think there's 38 Republican governors. It ain't for 50 states, man. And they control 42 or something like that of the state houses in this country are Republican controlled. You lost over a thousand seats in state in state elections, seats, and governorships. Are we crazy? 
So you try to look at the White House, now you lost Congress and the Senate. What, what, there's something deeper going on here, man. The Democrats ain't got no ground game. You, I, I mean, this. I don't. We, we no. We. Uh, I, 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 this. This is something that I. I just want to get your take on this. Uh, we can pivot out. Um, it's bothered me. Um, I haven't. Fi- I, again, I don't. I. Cu- we cut our TV. We. Uh, you know. Our, you know. We don't watch TV. I can stream anything I want. Mm-hmm. But can you talk about Philandro Castillo? I, I know this is something that plays out in our country all the time in some ways now we're fully interconnected so we can see this stuff i think the thing that bothers me is that um and this happened under obama as well but uh not not only was it just such a such an egregious over-the-top violent act and painful to see on top of that somehow in our justice system which is broken they can never convict a police a cop they can fire him, but justice is never served, and it's been going on forever. And it really and that and now with this 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 cat sessions from Southern Alabama, and we don't need to talk yeah. about so, okay. Now we got this thing, right. you know, protect the police, police valor. I mean, you're making right. you're politicizing yeah. justice, and I want you to talk about you have you have a longer arc on the on the on the scope of history, right? Because well, first been, of all, yeah. as as a black man in America. There's nothing new about that. The only thing that's new about white cops getting off when they kill somebody black, because obviously, obviously they don't kill too many white people, okay? No. White cops don't shoot too many white guys. No. So the difference is now what we're experiencing is even having a film of it right. doesn't make a difference. That's it, now, that's exactly. That's Rodney King, okay? Rodney King, you saw the footage. Oh, man, they got him this time. And those guys got off. Now we see white cops who can murder you in cold blood, okay, on film. And white people won't convict him in a jury. A, a, a white cop killing a black person. You see? So we saw the, the Eric Gardner in New York when he says, I can't breathe. That's on tape. But what's also on tape, and most people don't run the tape long enough to see, that unit, that, that crazy cop unit that snatches a guy because he was selling Lucy's in front of a store. Those are, for those that don't know, those are like uh, uh, one-off cigarettes. You can buy two or three cigarettes. Right, exactly. He yeah. ends up dying. The person that was head of that union unit when she walks up is a black woman, sergeant. You don't nobody brings that up. And and it's a collusion. It's just police. Hmm. But I'm saying the difference now people are seeing footage. The guy in New Orleans when the cop is on the top of him with the gun in his chest. Of course we're always reaching for a gun gun. It might have been a, a, a fucking comb. Excuse me, I don't know, you can edit that out. It might have been <laughs> a comb, but yeah. you know, yeah. you know, you get you know, you get me you get me riled up now because that's real. To see or the or the brother that was running you know, away from the cop in South Carolina, gets shot in the back, and then walks over to the to the body, and then drops his uh, taser. Talking about the guy was. I know you talk. I know exactly. He got off too. All these guys get off. So footage and film doesn't no longer means anything. And that's where America is. They will not convict a white cop. Okay. And that's why you have to have the first step to get to get away from that. You have to have independent prosecutors, not prosecutors who are elected. Remember, prosecutors get elected. They're elected officials. They run for office. So you have to have independent counsel. Now, that'll never really happen because it'll disrupt. And look what we're getting ready to see now. you got Jeff Sessions now wants to make a distinction between opioids because young, see, all of a sudden it's a crisis in opioids because white kids, young white kids in Massachusetts and Vermont, and, and, and New Hampshire are ODing. Absolutely. Black kids can OD every day, but that's crack or something else. No, don't. they go to jail. White kids, we got to get help. They're trying to get millions of dollars to help. Like, and look, I'm into all human beings need help, but they're going to actually make a distinction between what kind of dope you do. <laughs> One, and if you do a certain kind, you go to prison. The other kind, you get, you know, mental, you get mental and, 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 and so it's, it's, a, it's a social problem, man. It's a health problem. It's not a problem with prison. But the black kids will go to prison if they're doing crack. White kids, or if they're doing, you know, hardcore heroin, they go to, you know, a health place. But that's the reality we're in, man. I just, uh, we're talking to him too, May, here. We're, we're cooking away, you know. Um, I, I, I want to play you this uh, audio just just for the record. I, you know, you're all, we're, I'm always talking about you, and, and uh, I want you to listen to this person talking and then uh, what they're the, the talking about, and I think it, 
I want you to think about the distinction of understanding uh, uh, what Ndugu told me the other day. Um, this isn't Ndugu, mm-hmm. but, but in, what Ndugu said was that, um, well, and the long and the short of it is that if you don't know where you came from, uh, there's no way to know where you're going. So I want you to listen to this, Absolutely. and then uh, and then we'll yes, come sir. back and talk about it. How did you how did you get your uh, Swahili name? Uh, Mtume. Mtume gave you your name. Yeah, he gave. I was you know Mtume named me and his whole family, and Mtume was a very strong member of the US organization at the time, which is in Los Angeles. And uh, they were trying to learn Swahili as a language that we had abandoned, you know, as our own Absolutely. way of, 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 you know, of communicating. So he said, uh, so it was necessary for us to learn some African language, which was Swahili. So he named me, his whole family right now, today, all his kids, his grandkids, his wife, uh, and he Named Herbie Hancock, by the way, too. By the way, his name—that's where the M1 Dishi came from. He that's named M2 he man. named him M1 Dishi. That's where it came from, from M2 man, Yeah. And you're and you're it, mean, and you're it means kum, kum, it means composer. And you're Kumba, Kumba, Kumba. Yeah, Kumba means creativity, and he always thought that I was very creative, so he gave me that name. And the names always suited the person, whoever you are. The names would have something to do with your your personality. You know, uh, Herbie and Buster were like uh, students of the movement at, at the time, so they cooperated. And Herbie uh, actually abandoned that name for a long time. And now, you know, I just played with him a couple of weeks ago. Herbie finally started to not acknowledge the name because it was kind of... Uh, related to the injustice stuff that was going on in in our society. And uh, so Herbie didn't really want to participate in that, and neither did Buster Williams. Both of those guys became Buddhists. Right. I, actually, I, I ran into a cat who goes to the same Buddhist temple that they do. In, in, right. In so, you, yeah. so, you know, Buddhists and, and that, nationalism there was a conflict there you know so herbie you know although m Tumi gave him that name see i was in the group at that time in, in herbie's band it was buster and uh, he he kind of named everybody in the band m j zazi was buster kitu 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 was uh joe henderson and none of these guys kept that name because they didn't really have too much uh to do with this movement of uh, us identifying with Africa and all of that, Herbie didn't really did pay much attention to that. So he he went on and became a Buddhist, and this is like you know in the '60s, and he's been a Buddhist ever since. And Buster is too, and I understand now Wayne Shorter is as well. So I mean, in fa- in truth, I mean these names very much uh, stuck with. Herbie through the the mid early to mid seventies. I mean, he kept that. He had that M one Dishi band. Uh, well, that that came yeah, that came in the seventies. But you know, I don't know where. I don't know if Herbie named that band that, or I don't know how that happened. But I know M Tumi named Herbie M one Dishi. Uh, you know, when we, when I was in the band, and then the whole band got to be called. M1 and I don't, and I don't, I don't, I don't really know anything about how that happened. All right, brother. We're, you know, you're always in the cosmos. We're always talking about you. Who, 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 you know, you know who that is, right? Yeah, it's my uh, uncle. Uh, dude, the, the man, just the. I mean, I've done two interviews with him, and and uh, we just had a ball. Uh, but um, you know, I, I I look at it and I say. Um, it's great historical, uh, you know, sort of, uh, these are great stories, but, but I wonder right. about the, the overarching part is you talk about a two party system. You talk about the need for mm-hmm. a, a real movement, a con- social consciousness yes. movement. And yet the cats that are absolutely you, M1 Dishi means composer in Swahili. The, the, I mean, I'm right. not putting it all on Herbie, but I'm saying Buster, all these cats, 
that are still playing today prolifically. They're, they have, they're very well off. Um, they have done a lot in their career, but yet they backed away from their own cultural heritage. And I don't understand why. Well, I would, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't go that far. They didn't back away. Well, you just tell me, you tell uh, me what happened because I, you were there. No, I, no, no, yeah. no, no. They didn't back away from their heritage. I mean, there was, I mean, that was a particular of the path that we were on. Remember, the '60s was the era. I always say the the the, the, well, the, the, the late '60s, mid to late '60s, was began to be the, the, the my parents' era was the era of civil rights. Right. Which really represented the, the generation of uh, uh, civil disruption, you know what I mean? Sit ins and stuff like that. The, late, the middle to late 60s, going into early 70s, was the Black Power Movement, which was the generation of disruption. We went into anybody sitting there, anybody there were revolts all through the cities, you know, various urban areas, and people had different ways of approaching what they wanted to do. And I wouldn't say they, first of all, they were great jazz musicians. That's black culture at its essence. I can't say they stepped away from it, but they if they didn't use the names, they didn't use the names. They asked me to do that, and I did it. Uh, but they also did something uh, in that conversation you had with my uncle that was, was, was really deep. They used to carry a poster of the seven principles uh, of us organizations. Okay, okay, so on uh, no, uh, wait, wait, yeah, no, let's just do, this is so important. Your, your uncle, later in this conversation, we didn't play it, he, he, he said... There are seven principles. I said, "What are he, what are they?" He goes, yeah. "You're going to need to talk to them too, May. So let let's just break them down. Well, if you, if you I, I, this <laughs> is unity, yeah, yeah. self determination. I got it. You making me go back fifty no, years? I figured. I'm like, I'm like this unity. cat. He knows. He's still in his head. You know. <laughs> yeah. Unity, self determination, uh, collective working responsibility, political organization. Um. That's four, which, which five. I might, I might be out of order. And I'm like I said, you make me. I'm trying to. Remember I'm, so, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. But, I, I'm sorry to do that. That's, no, no, that's yeah. right. I don't mind. I don't mind being on a limb. I'm just scared of fall. <laughs> <laughs> five. Five. <laughs> five um, oh, me, me, unity. No, no, creativity, uh, faith. And then uh, ethos, which means uh, what is the emphasis of your culture? You know, if you talk about the Jewish community, we, what do you automatically think of? You know, you think of uh, finance and, 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 and education. Right. You know, you have, you have different things. I mean, when we think of what we do, man, the art, you know, and, 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 you know, we're trying to get the education up. But our thing was reconnecting. But the most important thing I think that came out of us, man, was the creation of Kwanzaa, which is still celebrated today, man. 47 years, 50 years later. So, I, we, you know, it did have an, imp an impact, man. But, um, like I said, I would not ever say they stepped away from or, 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 or you removed themselves from the culture. They were jazz musicians practicing, you know, black culture at the highest level. Well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dig this quote up because, uh, because your uncle talked about uh, essentially what was happening... Um, they the, the black the black nationalist movement there there was what he said was that it was too violent and it didn't coincide with the the Buddhist teachings so therefore there was a conflict I look at it and I well, say you know I don't go yeah I'm not I'm not saying I'm just saying it has to do with the names okay the pocket of time that I continue to go back to and marinate in is um is this Eddie Henderson period realization? Okay, it's like you know all the all. And first of all, it's so awesome that I get to talk to the cat who gave all these na beautiful Swahili names to all these cats. Okay, <laughs> by the way, uh, uh, ironically enough, um, you know this is what I want. Well, there's so many things in my head, but I, you know, it's just like like ironically enough on the realization album, which was cut on Capricorn, which was the Almond Brothers label. Um, the only cat, mm. it was a misprint. Obviously, Doctor McGanga. Uh, which is that means doctor it was Eddie Henderson um he mm -hmm. okay on the back of the vinyl um it it just uh all it says is Swahili name it doesn't actually say what his name was and I, I'll leave the guy nameless but the guy one a guy said it was so fitting because 
and this is this sort of the street code that I want to get your opinion on, is that Eddie, in some ways, was looked at as not completely authentic because he came from middle class. He came from money. Well, see, that was that's another misnomer, man. I want you to break it down. Uh, this is absolutely important. You don't have to come. Look, like Miles said, you don't have to be broke to play the blues, okay? <laughs> and you, you certainly didn't have to be poor to have a radical ideology. Right. I mean, because remember, that, that period I'm talking about, what was happening with young blacks was also happening with young whites. Right. That were coming out of, you know, Berkeley and, and the Weathermen and all these, you know, all, all these radical white movements, the anti-war movement. Those weren't poor white kids. These were, you know, well-educated, you know, coming from rich and middle-class families. It was a period of reanalyzation across the board. So they, and it just so happened that they were just happening at the same time. So you got the Black Panthers and the anti-war movement happening, and it's merging. These, these, these feelings are merging, and they're cross-race, and they're cross-class. As people identify, and then also... Remember, these movements were birthed out of, well, for black people, we were the first, that period of the 60s was the first generation of black kids who went to college as a generation. So we got exposed to what was happening. There was a lot of stuff happening. You had the liberation movement happening, you know, in, in Africa. You had the back. There was just a conference of all people of color. It's, it's, it, was a, it was an amazing period, man, you know. Are we, we, we're, uh, best you can, where, where are we at as far as the social conscious movement today? Uh, and how strong are the roots still? Like I said before, you know, part of it was also, you, you know, it was, you, it was using the, lang- the Swahili language, um, and it was... Edu- well, everybody remember, that, remember, I, not remember, because you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, let me remind you. Yes that we were a small aspect. It's not like radicalism was built into most, you know, the majority of the, of the black uh, uh, community. You know, radicalism wasn't a majority among, you know, the white community. It was just mostly this, this whole thing that was coming out of the college-educated students who were, or, or were, who were pursuing college, and we were just locking into, for the first time, a world movement. There was a revolution in the world. Now, today... I don't know if that kind of thing is, is necessary. I think what's necessary now is how to form coalitions and alliances. You can't do nothing, you know, if you just this or that. You've got to do it in, in being connected to something bigger, much more more of an umbrella. So that's that's my point. I mean, those those things were necessary for that time. I don't think that would even work now, it, and it shouldn't work, you know. But I think what we're talking about. Politically, I'm gonna go back to what my point was. Yeah. As a, this country is dying from a two-party system, and if anybody doesn't understand that, it's like you're gonna be more concerned with your pimples rather than the cancer you got. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my my pimples are clearing up, my acne's getting good. Yeah, but you got cancer, and we have a cancerous political system, and you have two parties. And remember, they don't go anywhere. They one has it for four years or eight, then the next one goes in. That's, it's, it's, it's silly. Okay, I, people, let me ask you. Let, 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 let me let me years. let me continue the voc- the dialogue. Can you talk to younger peeps who are less trusting, more insecure? How to recognize coalitions? Well, I would start off by saying this: the first thing you have to always recognize is no such thing as permanent friends or permanent enemies. Mm. The only thing you should concern yourself is permanent interests. Because sometimes who you think is a friend at that moment can be, in, you know, not your enemy, but not actually be in your corner. What, what do I mean by that? Black people are still now so indebted to the Democratic Party. But this is not the Democratic Party of the 60s. See, I'm old enough to remember the Kennedy. That's right. You know, John F. Kennedy and his brother. And I remember more, not, I shouldn't say more importantly, but much more impacting on our lives on, on, uh, was, was LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Now, see... In 1963, there was a great meeting that happened with uh, LBJ and Martin Luther King and the leaders of, of, of the civil rights movement. And what, 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 what Lyndon Johnson told them was, if you give me your vote in 64, I will give you 
a, 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 a civil rights bill. You understand the significance of that? So that's an agenda. See, black people, we don't have any agenda now. We, we, we get all thrown out of sorts over issues. An agenda. Marching was not, that was a tactic. That wasn't the overall strategy. When they had the Montgomery boycott, when black people wouldn't catch a bus for a year, you know, you know how much unity you got to have to do that? They carpooled each other. But it made the bus company come to its knees and then negotiate with them. That, the strategy was to, was to break the bus, down, bus company down so they would come to have to come to the table. You hit people in their pockets, man. You don't hit society on issue, you know, social issues. They don't care about that. You can't do anything if you don't hit them where it hurts. And that's the thing that people don't understand, man. And you got to do that. You can't do that with one community. That community has to connect to a larger umbrella. I mean, you, you feel what I'm saying? No, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I just, I, you know, this is important. This is, party, yeah, yeah. That whole thing with black people and the Democratic Party, we have now, it's not intelligent, man. If, if there's only two parties, that means, see, when white people lose an election, only a part of white people lose. And in other words, what do I mean by that? So you have a presidential election. The Democrats lose, okay? You split the screen. The Democrats are crying. Now, you split the screen, show the Republicans are celebrating. You understand? So half the white people lost. The other half won. When black people lose an election, meaning if the Democrats lose, we lose hope. And that's the devastating thing. We're so locked into them, we don't understand, man, that their interest is no longer about us. They're interested in winning. And they don't have, we don't have a, an agenda. There's no black agenda in the Democratic Party. When's the last time Democrats talked about poor people? When's the last time you heard the word poor come out of their mouth? No other ethnic group does that. Latinos, they're in both parties. Jews, both parties. Okay? Asians, both parties. Black people, Democrats. And we're so bad with it that if a black person does have the gall to try to cross the line, then they lose their black card. You understand? Their time and all that. Look what happened with the black people that were meeting with Trump. Uh, I mean, one of the things, one of the examples comes up, Steve Harvey, castigated. And the stupid part of that, how dare he meet with Trump? Now, the dumb part of that is the people didn't read, didn't understand. Steve Harvey, the, 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 the uh, Obama transition team called Trump and said they should meet with Steve Park, uh, Harvey because he was very much connected with Obama. And he thought he could be of help. Jim Brown, Ray Lewis. Jim Brown is an icon, not just in football, but in black culture. Absolutely. All the stuff he did with Muhammad Ali. And then, keep the, you know, you got people talking about Jim Brown, a football player, meeting with the president. He shouldn't be. Well, if you're not going to meet with the president, idiot, who are you going to meet with? Because with Archer screaming and crying, he's not going away unless you impeach him, okay? And even if you impeach him, Pence is coming in. Hillary's not coming in. You still, you still a Republican administration. So where do we go from there? We got to re. The thing is, thinking is hard. Rethinking is even more difficult. And until Black people rethink their relationship with the Democratic Party, we will constantly be raised and lowered by them winning or losing. Like I said, that's only one half. The other half of white people, and then everybody else. If they win, it's only two parties. That means somebody wins and somebody loses. We perpetually lose if we go down with the Democrats. Talking to him too. Does that make sense? No, I mean, you know, I, I think you are being. There's a couple of things. I, I am not. Uh, uh, I, I, I completely look at myself as uh, somebody who was raised in a in a Democratic household, uh, and uh, right. I can see the tunnel vision and uh, and everything you're saying is it's uh it's humbling and it's also truth and i but you know um it, it's not something that's going it, it, it maybe they'll be in the wilderness for a long time i just to me it's like uh part of it is also look trump is 71 years old uh he's from the boomer generation mm -hmm. uh and some there's something just in general about the baby boom, boomer generation that's really unwilling to leave stage left on um, they're unwilling to leave the party and allow my general right. gen xers gen y's and not millennials yet but cats to come in and you know you, you look at a play out in atlanta you had a, 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 a again what was he running on uh, you know he, he this younger cat Asoff. he was a 
you know, kind of almost a, mm-hmm. a Kennedy looking cat, you know, nice looking guy, thirty years yeah, old. But he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't a progressive. He was. He was. A, it's very moderate. Okay? You know, I mean, it just it, it, it's an you know we we, we I want to in I need I want to ask you about this. I'm, I want to take you to Never Neverland again. Um, okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I want you to talk to the audience. This is one of the most fascinating things I've been covering. I interviewed uh, Leo Nocentelli about it, and I also uh, just talked to this cat who played um, with Eddie Bo, a bass player named Paul Boudreau. Uh, down in in Mm -hmm. New Orleans, uh, this idea that um, he had family members that were, his mom grew up on a plantation, and uh, his cousins, uh, eventually, um, one of them, uh, you know, ran away. And at the time, uh, the Indians, Native Americans, would house these slaves and protect them. So once they were free, uh, they were taking back from the Indians tambourines, and drums, and all of a sudden you had this these these black Native Americans mixed. Uh, you had this incredible heterogeneous mix going on down there of yeah. a- African rhythms. Especially in Florida, man. Especially in Florida, yeah. And, yeah. So I want you to talk. If you could educate the audience to talk about how those th- that how that connects to to the ultimately to the roots of diaspora. Well, I, I, I have to. You know, I, I, I'm always trying to be straight. I'm not an ethnomusicologist. No, but you're no, but you've been on the. Yeah, I know you're not. I I didn't. I don't. I don't interview. I I know you're not because the the ethnomusicologist would. I'd be staring at the wall. It'd be a boring response. I'm looking for like the. (laughs) You know, this this to me is like so because you know the Wild Chipolitas did stuff in in the late '70s that had to do with call and response, fusing the Indian and the and the African rhythms. But the first cat Mm -hmm. was this guy Boudreaux. In this band uh, with Eddie Bo and Bobby Williams, they did this tune, and it was called. Um, I'm looking at it right here, it's called the Boogaloo Mardi Gras. It's in two parts. That was the first. If you listen to that, '69, just burning like Boogaloo with you have uh, you have the the the. You have the African rhythms, mm. and you have the, but you have the ch- the call and response. So you have the two different dialects going back and forth. And I just want you to talk a little bit about, um, I, I take it out of the lore and the, and, and just talk about it from a pragmatic and what you were hip to and what you were learning about. I realize you're not a musicologist, and that's fine. Yeah, you know, so I don't, I don't want to think anybody. I, I don't like speaking on something. You're not a, you're not a politic. Really you're, you're not a political science guy, and we've been riffing on that. That's so, right, right, you know, right. Yeah. Political science. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I did play one on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you, you would say you were mentioning these cats' name, and, I, and one of the things that hit me, uh, Zigaboo Modelis. Do you know who that is? Oh, right? well, no, I mean the street beat, baby. The street. Zigaboo. Yeah, Zigaboo Modelis mm. was the drummer for uh, the Meters. Uh, the Meters. It was one of the most interesting and and compound, complex, uh, you know, punk drummers. You know. Uh, if you listen to the Sissy Strut, it was one of their big hits. I mean, his beats were just... And all the jazz cats that came out of New Orleans, Ed Blackwell, cats like that. James uh, Black. I cat, another cat. James Black. Huh? James Black. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Another another cat named John Boudreaux. Um, I did a... You know, I was around these cats, and, and they talked about... And that that's a, a, also a place where that marriage of the Indian culture, you know, like you're just talking about. And, and, and blacks came together... And then Florida, you got place in Florida where, where the runaway way slaves were always, I mean, were always welcome in, into the Native American camps. But it's for me, all this thing, all this stuff just traces back to Africa, man. Mm-hmm. So there's the there's just the the obvious ocean that broke off into just various streams, and you have these uh, mixtures and, and combinations of, of of culture and and interpretation. Of music that every every ethnic group brings its own interpretation, and when you start mixing those chemicals together, man, you come up with something that um, is it's, it's unbelievable combinations, man. So I, I, I've never been shocked at any of them of it, man. And I and I tell you, I didn't really. I had the first time I went to Africa was ninety ninety six. I went to Ghana. No, the first time I went to Africa was ninety two. I was in in, in uh, South Africa. But the first time I went to Africa and spent time was in I went to Ghana in '96, and um, they were having uh, a celebration. I think it was their 45th anniversary of their liberation, 
and um, a king had died. And in 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 Ghana, when a king dies, the mourning go, is, is is extended for a year. Wow. Okay, they have diff- different events over for a year to mourn the passing of a king. So they were having this 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 these these, these groups that were performing, and I happened to drive up there. And there was about this group of about 15 conga players. And man, as much as I thought I was clear, <laughs> you know what I mean? I listened to all of that, you know. Yeah, all the records, sure. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, I was into Ono Tunji, man. I heard, I heard him when I was 13. <laughs> but look here, man. They were playing so much stuff, you know, in the time signatures. You know, I'm here five, six, and seven all being played at the same. Man, that I had to get up. And I walked in the middle of them and just stood there. It was being like in the middle of a sunrise concert. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just stood in the middle of the musicians. Wow. And it was the most exhilarating emotion. I, like Miles said, it was the most fun I'd ever had with my clothes on. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just, you, when you open yourself up, man. But then I realized, I re- realized again the power of the drum. Mm. And everything comes out of what? The beat. It all starts with the beat, like like James Brown said. Everything is on the one. The the thing about uh, what Boudreaux was saying yesterday, also it was it was intoxicating because you had Leo, who was a stone jazzer coming up. You had the Gibson three. He could have gone mm-hmm. to he could have gone to New York and been a studio cat, studio shark. Right. Uh, Porter played jazz, but Zig came from the second line bands, the, and that's all those cats mm-hmm. were raised was just. Think that it did the, 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 the just the constant rhythms, you know, and so that street yeah. instead of being sort of a a bebop jazz guy, I mean, he was laying that that groove down on the trap set and then slowing it down, and that's what made it so intoxicating. It just to me, it's that it, it is so, and that's and that's what, and I'll just I just wanted to read this to you as we wrap here. I mean, you know, what Indugu said, he goes. I had the pleasure of meeting Elijah Muhammad in my local barber shop. He came in putting posters up talking about uh, Muhammad's speech. When you can connect with those great leaders, uh, because sometimes it's just what they touch you with and means more than you just committing to one or the other. He said, there's an old proverb, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. When it comes to this music that we play, the roots are deep-seated, not just musically, but historically. Politically, economically, and socially in the roots of Africa. When you talk about the slave trade, you talk about the music. When you talk about the religions, it ties Mm -hmm. into the music. When you talk about the different geographical locations in Africa and the rhythms and the drums, the music of those places you're dealing with the roots of acculturated people. The interesting thing about living in the United States, that uh, African culture, even though it's deep-seated and rooted in the States, there are two other factions that play into that. The Native American culture which is also part of the Afrocentric diaspora. Also the migration mm-hmm. of the African slaves going through the West Indies and Brazil, Puerto Rico, all the islands. When oh, you, yeah. When you deal with yeah. all of that, the more you know about that, the more you understand and appreciate that we're all part of the same whole. The music relates to us right. in totality and not just segmented, divided. It's all from the same tree trunk of the Af- African diaspora that has migrated across the world. That's all I. All I'm saying is I basically, I mean, believe it or not, as you know, I've part of my show. I've totally dedicated to this, this this entire. I know, co- I know, and, and, and I, I know and where I'm, you at. You know, I know where you're coming from, man. So I where, 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 I mean, remember, where, where's we, the, we yeah. were the last to be dropped off. America was the last stop on the slave trade. I mean, Brazil, like you said, through, through and then through the, 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 the Caribbean. Yep. Oh yeah, the, the last stop was America, man. And don't forget, slaves were also taken to Europe. I mean, so this music and this culture, man, has been spread over the years, man, over the world, man. And it's, it's embedded in the DNA of sound in the world. It's in the DNA, and there's nothing they can do to change that, ever. <laughs> I just want to know that there are still hot... That that cats are... Will, younger, Pete, younger cats are willing to go back far enough to know the roots of the music and not cut off at rock and roll or cut off at boogaloo acid jazz with Idris Muhammad. Where did Idris come from? Where did Zig come? You know, the, it's, uh, Zig, is from, Zig is from New Orleans. No, no, I'm saying, but where does the sound trace back oh, oh, to wait, going wait, back? Okay, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. that's the, the point. R&B, of, yeah, right, right. Yeah, R&B. Look, 
I, I, I was I was thinking about this when you were making your quote. Yeah, funk is 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 the the natural continuation of Africa in a way that combines the instruments that we have here. Funk more than jazz, okay? Funk. James Brown is is is, is the godfather, man, because. He kept that thing. When you hear funk music, man, the Parliament Funkadelic, when you hear, you know, that the beat, everything evolves from the beat. And, like, and we died, you know, when I, because when one of my main, you know, for a long time, I was avant garde, you know, acoustic avant garde. Oh, big music. time. I love it, record. man. I freaking love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, you know, playing with Miles when I got with Miles, no, but I was always into funk, but that wasn't what I was playing. And I had to go through what I was hearing in order to evolve to the next level, you know? Um, but then when Miles comes along, he combines all the information and puts it into this one pill, you know? And then I was fortunate enough to be with him when, we, when he was at it, what I consider his most experimental, you know, in, you know, 71 through 75 and six. And, um, and then he basically, he yeah. A and lot he, of information. No, I mean, this is, listen, uh, we're three for three. I mean, this. I, I had such a great time. It's so nice to hear your voice, man. And I and I really uh, appreciate you enlightening me. And and uh, and I just think that it's you know it's just it's about a hard look in the mirror. And uh, you know I'm gonna come out and you know next time we're gonna meet in person and do, and do a live interview together. Yeah, man. man. <laughs> you know I'm having a ball. Man. Much so love. Look, yeah. It's always a ball. It's always a ball for me too, man. So look, you edit this stuff up so we ain't, we don't put people to sleep. Because <laughs> nobody's going to sleep. You know, you know. The, the, eventually, listen, the, and this stuff will live on long after we're gone. But yeah, let's just stay in touch. Oh, yeah, don't, 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 don't disappear and 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 just uh, be strong. And, and well, if I, and look, if I, if I'm, if you, if you get a gap, brother, then make sure, make sure you check on me. <laughs> I, I'm you, all, you know, me, I'm always checking check in. Me. Me. Much love to you, yes, man. You are, all right, man. have I, a beautiful I, day. I greatly appreciate that, man. Hey, man, have a great day, brother. All right, man. Same to you, man. Give my regards to your family, man. All right, him too, man. Much love. Bye, bye. All right. Take care, man. All right, man. Peace. That's it for the Jake Feinberg show and uh, the ten to eleven hour. We are going to be uh, joined uh, momentarily here by uh, the great Doug Martin and Solomon on blast in about four minutes.